you all hoping that these are all live now. Why don't we go down the row and introduce everybody? Hello, um, Antoine Grant. Michael? I don't know. I'm Antoine Grant. I'm with McKinsey and Company. I work with venture capitalists, startups, and my career being company actually. Uh, working with Techie and telecom companies. In between my two cents and consulting, um, I work with venture back startups, one that's worth about $4 billion right now. Done technology and product development. Um, I work with media companies, etc. Hi, good morning. I'm Bai Lowy. I'm with uh, Spot Capital. I'm a partner there. We're a growth equity firm. Really start to interact with companies and kind of the teams of revenue, maybe 20 million revenue. Power Alley's probably a little bit larger. 30 to 200 top line revenue businesses. Um, my background is an entrepreneur, started a handful of companies, uh, so we launched some of those in 2007, and uh, have been an investor in the firm for about the past 10 years. I'm Cody Anderson, uh, early team at Cardup, I'm on the strategic uh, accounts team currently, I've been with the firm for a little over four years. I'm gonna try this. I'm Steve Meltzer. I'm a partner in the law firm of Pillsbury Winthrop Shop Pittman. Um, my father was a lifelong entrepreneur. I grew up in his businesses. I have an MBA from Harvard Business School. I've spent my entire career helping people build high growth companies, mostly in technology. One example is Tenable Security, which is now a NASDAQ traded company and very successful. I'm also an affiliate of Blue Venture Investors, which is a super angel group. Well, it's hard to talk all of this here, but um, good morning, everyone. My name is Rose Paz. I'm with Legal Advantage. Uh, we work closely with universities, law firms, and corporations to help put together the pieces for patent applications and uh, help them through their IP due diligence. Cool. That's awesome. Thank you. Very seen group. Absolutely. So let, let's start this off. Let's say you're you're you've got a team, right? You, it's either yourself, maybe you've got a couple, three founders, you've got this idea. What do you do with that, right? How, is it good enough to go or, 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 is, or do you just shelve it? Is it one of the 50 ideas that you have? How do you, how do you kick that off? Steve, why don't you start us off? Because a lot of this starts with the law firms, no doubt. You see the entire life cycle. How many potential entrepreneurs come to you and say, hey, Steve, I've got this idea. How do they sort that out? First of all, if it's just one person, it's not very interesting to me. Because I don't think that one person knows it all and can do it all. So the first thing I say is, have you got a team? A team to me is probably three people minimum. Uh, my second question is, have you had experience in building businesses? Uh, and if you haven't, do you have people who you are working with as advisors who have that experience? Or are you just trying to gut it out all by yourself? Um, if you're doing the latter, again, that's not very interesting to me. Because if you already know it all, what do you need me for? <laughs> um, so, uh, assuming you have a team, and, and I'm going to kill that. I'm going to use this. Because I don't want to. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, if you have a team, and the question, and I've done some coaching. I spent six years coaching in the Kaufman Foundation Fast Track Program for Tech and Life Sciences Entrepreneurs. So, if you got your idea, then the question is, does anybody want to buy what, what your idea is going to produce? That's the key question. Not do they like it, do they want to buy it? And so you got to do some, you got to develop. Um, I don't want to say vaporware. Um, the, the saying these days is an MVP. It takes a little time to get to an MVP. MVP is minimum viable product. Um, so that you can go to some people who are who you think will need your product and uh, ideally are thought leaders in whatever market you're going after and see whether, not just that they like it, whether they need it. Uh, there's a there's, a, there's an old saying that somebody who I thought was very smart uh, told me, which is, there's a reason why we're born with two ears and only one mouth. And the reason is because you've got to listen. 
And uh, so you, you, you do your idea, you do your elevator speech, then you shut up and you intake information so that you get the idea of whether people really, really need what you've got. It's either going to make money for them or it's going to save them a hell of a lot of money or it's going to solve some big problem they have such that they're willing to pay for So Steve, quick question. I don't know how this is. What is sort of the minimum level that a team needs to come to you and you say, okay, that makes sense, let's move forward? Well, I judge the people uh, more than the product. I'm not a technical expert. I work in IT, defense, intelligence, healthcare, life sciences. I'm not an expert in most of those technologies. So I, my judgment is by the people. Are these people, they seem to know what they're doing, they seem to be willing to listen, do they have a team, are they the kind of people I work, I, I want to work with? Do, do you they want seem honest, for one thing. Uh, so, sorry, Steve. Do you want them pre-funding, or do you want a certain amount of funding? What do you look for there? If they have some people in on the team who are experienced, most of my stuff comes from referrals. Mm -hmm. So. One big criteria for me is, where is the source? Where do these people come from? They come from somebody I know and trust, and the person I know and trust is working to help them, that I'm less concerned with how much funding they got, and I'm willing to help them. Unlike some of my competitors, I do not tell every Tom, Dick, Harry, Jane, Gene, that I can find money for them, <laughs> because that's a lie. Only the entrepreneurs can find money. But if they got a good team, I know where they came from, I trust the people who sent them to me, then I'm willing to work with them. Excellent. Now, and so Antoine, you're from McKinsey, and you're part of their venture team, Fuel. It's a little different. You guys are now have a different model. Can you talk us through some of that and what you look for when you would maybe get engaged? So I do want to piggyback on, on Steve's uh, earlier points around the idea. I do, I do think there is a difference between the first time entrepreneur and probably more experienced entrepreneurs. I've seen them raised with essentially a, a five-page PowerPoint deck. But that's because they've done it before, they have a team, they have credibility. So um, don't think that because someone else did it, you can do it unless you are also bringing that to, to the table. Typically, they already have customers that they can go out and they can sell to. What we look for um, when we're working with companies or we're evaluating companies, um, so ideas is, is probably just a starting point. So your original idea is not going to be the business that you end up with. It's really a first hypothesis, right? And so the idea has to be decent, but your ability to kind of push that idea, convince people to join the team, convince capital providers um, is, is more important. Um, Steve was talking about as well as traction, right? So we typically don't engage until a company has um, some customers, some capital, they have proven themselves, or it doesn't really make sense for us to jump in and try to accelerate that growth. So getting those initial customers is, is probably the, the most important. Um, the way that we evaluate whether or not a, a company does have significant runway is we look at the market, right? We call that total addressable market consulting speed. But really it's how big of, of a pie is out there and what that competitive intensity looks like. Then we want to evaluate um, the inner workings of that business. So your business engine, right, and your marketing engine. Do those, do those two things have the ability to continue to propel that business going forward? And then the last thing would be the probability of the company looking like uh, a unicorn, right? And so that's pattern matching. That's going out and saying, okay, a company like yours or analogous to yours. Define unicorn. So a unicorn is a company, you know, it's, it's basically a large company, a company that has a billion dollar valuation. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen quite, quite a bit more being produced, and that's because of the environment that we're in. People are looking for yield. SoftBank has raised a large fund. Companies are staying private longer, but also the public markets um, are demanding um, a little bit more professionalism and traction and revenue and profitability for you. Excellent. So now, Steve, I'm an entrepreneur. I come in. I got referred to you. You like me. Don't have the money yet. But I have a team. Now we have to figure it out. What are we doing? Are we setting up an LLC, a C Corp, Delaware? Talk to me about that. Okay, well, you can start with an LLC or an S Corp. Um, 
and, and some people are really in love with LLCs. Uh, the problem with LLCs is they don't scale very well. Um, and they don't scale very well because if you try to give somebody what looks like a stock option in an LLC, uh, it's either a profits interest or an option for a profits interest, and the average young tech person doesn't even know what that is. Uh, so it's kind of less attractive than your basic stock option. And as you get into more different classes of equity, your operating agreement, which has a bunch of tax provisions and describes all the different classes and so on and so forth, gets very complicated. And you get to the point, if you are successful at raising money and bringing on people, where nobody understands what's in your operating agreement. Let me, let me time you out for one second, because you, you just brought something up that's very important. And we're going to talk here, and we're going to talk today about venture and unicorns, everything like that. But there's a lot of great companies, like if you look at Marcus Lemonis and The Profit, whatever, that don't need venture funding, that maybe have an LLC that could be a really great company. Maybe you want them as a client. Maybe an entrepreneur wants to start there. Can you kind of walk us through that? Some, there are some very large companies that are LLCs. Cargill, huge grading company. Closely held is an LLC. Why? Because they're a family-owned company. They don't have all these issues. And uh, so, and, and an LLC, like an S-Corp, is a pass-through entity, meaning it doesn't pay income tax, meaning that there's one layer of tax that's removed. And these companies, if your company generates great cash flow, and you're really happy with the cash flow, and you want to keep it going, then being an LLC is a good thing because you're not paying any corporate tax. Um, that's different than building a venture type company that is either going to be, it's going to be financed by venture capital or private equity or something, and it's going to go public or it's going to be sold. Um, if that's the kind of company you're building, you're eventually going to become a regular C-Corp. You can go from being an LLC or an S-Corp to a C-Corp pretty easily. You can't go the other way. Okay, so I come in, I want to be a C Corp. I want to get venture funding. I want to do everything. I've got me and a couple other founders here, and I want to also bring Cody into this discussion. How do we split up this founder stock? What does that even mean? What are we going to do with that? You know, I, I took a course when I was in law school called Business Planning from a pretty well-known professor, <laughs> and so we had this case. We had uh, we had the, the money guy, the the tech guy, and the management guy or gal, and, uh, and they were going to form a company. So the first question was, how many lawyers do we need? Uh, if your answer was four, one for each of the three, and one for the company, you fail. Uh, because nobody can afford that kind of stuff at the early stage. So for me, I represent the enemy. I'm not representing the individuals. So your group has to have already come together as a group. Uh, you can work out the fine points, but if you're still fighting with each other about who's doing what to whom, you got to work that out before I'm going to get involved. Um, and so you should have a pretty good idea when you come in to see me how you're going to divide up the equity originally. Uh, and then you're going to do simple documents because you can't get all wrapped up in, in permutations and combinations about what happens if she gets divorced or he dies or uh, something happens. Because all of these handsome agreements that you want to draft, number one, cost money which you don't have. And number two, when somebody comes in to fund you, they're going to throw them in the trash anyway and say, these are the right. documents I want. Yes. Exactly. But there's some there's some different rules, there's, or not rules, but there's some sort of guidelines, stuff like that. If you have one founder that says, hey, I want 90% and, and they think they're going to have that when they go IPO, probably not realistic. Cody, this is right up your alley. Talk to me a little bit about what you guys do and how you look at it. Sure. So uh, my company, Carta, uh, formerly eShares, we help predominantly venture-backed U.S.-based companies manage uh, ownership, more or less. Uh, the way I look at it is we make it much easier for these companies to think strategically and give them a long-term view as how they're going to align the incentives as they grow in the organization. Um, we see this all the time at the early stage where these founders 
they don't have the expertise, the domain expertise to, to do this, so they rely on a lot of advisory and uh, you know, consultation. And you know, we take the approach where you should probably go talk to your lawyers. <laughs> uh, but you know, to, to Steve's point, I mean, it really it really does depend on on the situation. Uh, you're 100 percent right. From the time that this, you know, it's it's a couple guys or gals in, in a garage and they own the entire company to the time of the IPO, they're not gonna own as much of that company because you know, they're gonna rely on outside capital and they're gonna need to bring on and, and uh, you know, develop and grow a team. And the best people oftentimes in, in these uh, communities, they know what they're worth and they're, you know, they're gonna require that and a lot of times that takes some form of, some form of ownership. So let me, let me say a couple things. And I used to do this up zero to IPO talk a lot of business schools, it's been a long time. Um, and I would also trail Mario when he, when he did it and stuff like that, so I don't have my notes out. But just I want to just put some broad strokes out there. Exactly, these guys, are, this is perfect. If Usually you're going to be tech heavy or business heavy on the founding team. Usually, not always, sometimes you have an open team, but you usually have an incomplete team. And you have to understand that and recognize that going forward. If you go to a Series A, the venture folks and, and Bayan and others can tell us that you're usually going to want to see something between 13 to 20 percent of a stock option pool. Why? Because they know you're going to have to hire people to build this thing out. You can't do it yourself, not all by yourself, right? And then when you go and you do that Series A, you're probably going to give up somewhere between 20 to 50 percent. And 33% is kind of, you know, the, the benchmark. So you have to ask yourself, when you start, before you get funded, what do you need? What's missing? You're not ready to go public yet. You may not even be ready for that Series A. But, but what's missing? And how do you guys have that conversation with these founders about how they get the rest of these pieces in place? Anyway. First of all, it's a great idea to have an org chart. Because uh, if you have an org chart, you can tell what's missing. Uh, if you don't have a CFO, you <laughs> have a box that says CFO. Uh, and you might start out with a controller, but you got to have somebody who can do the numbers. Because um, if you can't keep track of the numbers, nobody's going to invest in you. That's reasonable. With, with a stated and well-grounded assumption. So, uh, you need a chief marketing officer, probably not right away. It depends on, certainly if you're, if you're pre-revenue, you don't need one yet. But you need a, you need a sales plan, you need a business plan, uh, which includes some idea of at least how much capital you're going to need in the next year, year and a half, uh, based on some assumptions about where you're going to get to and by a certain time frame and leaving plenty of room for bad things to happen. Right. Because everything always takes longer and costs more by a multiple than you think it will. And, and we were talking, you mentioned earlier about, you know, you start out with one product and then it evolves. Uh, sometimes these things are known as pivots. Mm. You start out as with with this product and then you discover that the market really doesn't want this product the way you've got it right now, you gotta shift it to another variation of that product. You might even scrap the product altogether because you figured out what the customer base that you're after really needs and you can build it. All of this takes time and costs money. I would, I would jump in. <clears throat> um, in really simplistic terms, kind of what we've seen that you go from idea to product, product to company, and then company to enterprise. Um, so the, through those four distinct stages, you're gonna have different needs and different expectations of the company. So when we're talking about equity and how you split up equity, it's very important to have vesting, a lot of these other terms that you guys have probably heard to make sure that uh, incentives are aligned. We're talking about early employees, typically they're gonna be more all-around athletes than specialized employees. So, as Steve was talking about drawing the, the box around the CMO, CFO, that might not be needed in the earlier stages, but you'll know that you'll need it later. So splitting up the company and giving people a solid piece of equity and very high level titles can be uh, very dangerous because that company you don't know what it's going to turn into later. You don't know what those needs are going to be. And having someone as a CFO that has a third of the company with no vesting, four years later, when now you have 20 products, uh, this person is no, no longer part of the company issue. 
excellent points. And I think that they're the sound person saying that these all work if you just get a little bit closer and we'll try it. Um, that's the that's the that's the challenge, right? That's that's the sort of catch twenty two. On the one hand, you need to scale very quickly. On the other hand, how much equity do you give out? Uh, if, I, if I remember right, I might be rem remembering incorrectly. I think Don Valentine, <laughs> famously of Sequoia, said that he's never fired a CEO too early. So, you, so definitely, a lot of times, what happens when you go through this process? The, the people that are amazing at making the ideas aren't always the best at running a public company. Usually that's very, very rare. But let's fast forward this because I want to bring in the rest of the panel. We've been joined by Sumner Webster down there, one of our sponsors, and also Rose Paz Legal Advance, one of our sponsors. Sumner Webster Iron Forge. And let's kind of hit this from two different angles because I want to hit the Series A. I want to talk about growth capital. I want to talk about hitting that IPO. So Sumner, you have let's say some technical people that came in to you and they don't understand how do I do a website, how do I market, how do I do all that, what would you do for them? What, what would the San Diego Angel uh, Group do for them in Iron Forge? Well, I think there's two things. One, if they're a software company and they can't build software, the first answer is come back to me in two years when you build something, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, I actually take a little bit of a different stance uh, than everyone here, it sounds like. Um, I actually like investing in non technical Look, tech is being commoditized. You know, rebuilding Uber, rebuilding any of these tech platforms 99% of the time is actually fairly simple. It's not that hard. The value we've seen on a lot of these IPOs is actually in the user base, and that is sales. That's marketing. Um, from those guys, you know, as John said, these businesses evolve, their needs evolve in a very, very real way. The guy that can be your CFO today is not the guy you want your CFO when you go public. And so I firmly believe that minimizing your costs and then basically driving your value through risk management early in that business. As quickly as you can, try to find those guys that are gonna be long-term employees. What I promise you, by the time you go from pre-seed to seed, probably 50 to 80% of your team will be swapped out for new needs and new organizational propositions. So. So, awesome, that's phenomenal. Rose, now I am a technical team. A lot of that around here. Biotech, I'm doing tons of patents or cybersecurity, whatever. How would I engage Legal Advantage? What do you see from your perspective that you can help with when it comes to the prior art and that challenge for these technical uh, folks? Um, so there are a few different stages that we can help out in. Um, we start out with the very basic, uh, or not basic, but I guess the, the most narrow search that we can, um, the knockout search. So that helps find anything that's either identical or highly similar to something that, you know, the idea that you might have. Um, and as you progress, you know, there's a, a way to get all the way up to licensing and searching. You want to target the other players in the field. So we- Not, not to interrupt, but you're high level. Let's say I don't know any, not, not I me, mean, we have to be move quick too, but I don't know anything about patents. What does that mean? Why do I want a patent? What are you gonna do for us? Obviously Steve can jump in here too, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, let, yeah. yeah. So um, definitely important to, I think, protect the innovation that you're working on, whether it be a product, process, um, method. There's, you, you wanna be able to, I guess, avoid any, uh, any other person from replicating your, your idea. So it's definitely important to have um, done your due diligence, dig up if there's anything like that out there before you invest so much in, in that. So I'm doing a patent. I've obviously engaged Steve for, or, and his firm, which is a great firm for patent work. Do you work with the law firms? Are you going to save us money? Are you going to help with the time? Do they like you? Do they not like you? Yes. Uh, so we definitely, most of our clients are um, uh, IP attorneys, patent attorneys. We also work with trademark attorneys. Um, and so we usually see, you know, that middle person. Um, so we don't always work directly with the inventor. Um, I highly, highly suggest that you know, partner up with that um, law firm and figure out the legal steps to get there. There are sometimes private inventors that come to us directly, but um, they don't understand at all how the process works. So once you learn what the steps are in putting together that patent application, um, we usually partner up with the law firms that are going to be helping you draft the application, uh, working through any infringement that might happen. So we are putting the pieces together for the patent attorney to help you Get, get right Steve, real quick, what's your take on the whole patent thing? How much money should I spend? Am I going all over the world? What am I thinking? Of? Uh, it depends on the kind of business you have. Okay. If you are developing a new drug, <clears throat> your patent is absolutely critical. Um, because 
new drugs are different than just about any other business you can, you can think about. It, it might cost a billion dollars to get that drug to market. But once it gets to market, you don't need to worry about marketing because there are people dying of a lot of diseases. And, and the big drug companies are starving for new products. But you have to have a strong patent position. Because if you don't have a strong patent position, you've got no value. So if you're a drug company, your patent is absolutely critical. If you are a software company, in most countries of the world, you can't even get a patent right. on software. Um, and in the US, it's getting harder and harder. Now, nevertheless, Google, IBM, all these big companies have huge numbers of patents. So if you can get a patent in the US, it's a good thing because at least it'll slow down your competition. Uh, ultimately, you're going to build value based on your customer base, your brand. Uh, you're going to have to carve out your place in the market. It's not going to be because you've got the world's greatest patent, but it's a good, it's a good start. It's, it keeps the competitors at bay, at least the honest ones, for a little while. And you can build a patent strategy and a patent portfolio. You can't spend a fortune on it. If you patent in every country in the world, you're going to go broke doing it. So, so you have to have a, a, a well thought out strategy. No, absolutely. Let's fast forward this. I want to bring Bayon right in here. And we have to hit a couple stages here. Series A. I'm doing a Series A. I've got all this big thing together. I've got some venture folks that are interested. Give me two minutes on that. What are we looking at on the term sheet? What are we looking at on these types of terms? What can I expect as, an, as, a, as a company, CEO, or team of going through that process? And then I want to see what World Capital looks like next. This is the uh, this is Series A. Series A, OK. So uh, if you've ever had any experience with venture capital financing, you'll know that a set of Series A documents is about that thick, usually. Um, it, there's a there's a lot of due diligence. Even though I heard John talk about the fact that some people overdo due diligence, by the time you get to a Series A, you're talking about five to ten million dollars. Uh, the way they do due diligence, you'll have a data room. You'll put all your stuff in there. They'll look at it. But your the purchase agreement where they buy all of their preferred stock, by the way, not common stock, is is going to have a lot of reps and warranties in it that your company is going to make. And somebody, and many tech people don't have the patience for this, somebody's got to read through all that language very carefully and figure out whether all that is true. And a lot of it is not true the way it's stated. So you've got a schedule of exceptions. And and, and that, that basically flushes out all of the uh, all the flaws, all the blemishes in your situation. How many, I mean, very, very quickly, how many deals do you see go sideways in due diligence? And also, if I'm a company, am I giving up a board C? What, what am I looking at giving up generally? Well, first of all, I don't very often see deals go sideways in due diligence. Okay. Because by the time you get the term sheet and you start going through the reps and warranties and the documents, the investors know you pretty well. and. Uh, so you got to do your homework because whatever they buy off on in terms of your warrants, uh, you're good. You're good to go. You're not going to have any problems. Um, what was your other question? Board seats. Am I giving oh, up board seats? Yes, yeah, you're definitely giving up a board seat. One, two. Uh, usually two. One for the venture people themselves, and one for somebody in their stable of executives. Um, I have seen an amazing number of entrepreneurs who can't count to 10 very well. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you start out with a board and you try to pick qualified people, not your mother, your brother, your sister, uh, people who are qualified, but people who see the world the same way you do and they, they'll vote with you. Um, as you raise more and more money, the founders have a smaller and smaller percentage of the company. Hopefully all of you understand the concept of dilution. Your percentage goes down, hopefully your value goes up as you're building the company. I think Steve Case owned about 1% of AOL when I ate public. He's not a poor man. Right. So, but as you continue to raise money and, and people want board seats and you get to go 
five is a, is a good number until you get to, uh, maybe you'll go over that with an A, but you'll probably go over that with a B. Uh, if you get to seven, now you gotta really count carefully. Because, uh, and, and, and once you have investors, you have to bring them along with you. You have to ask them what, you have to tell them what you're doing. I had one CEO who uh, uh, was running behind on his budget. So he decided to go on a, a, a marketing blitz and he spent all his money. But he didn't tell his VC that he was doing it. He didn't ask for his opinion. Oof. So it, the, the marketing blitz didn't work. He ran out of money. He came to the VC and he said, okay, I tried this, it didn't work. And the VC said, you didn't ask me. You didn't get my input. So if I put in more money, you're out. Uh, and I'm gonna put it in at a value that it's going to be punitive to your equity. And that's very interesting. I, I, I want to talk about the concept of founder shares, everything like that, but I'm going to table that for now. It may have to be in another panel. Let's say, this is great. So now we've been funded, we've got it, we're running. Buy on, I'm coming to see you because now I need another round. It's, I need my billion dollars to take this drug to market. What are you going to do for me? Yeah, so um, that's, that is kind of where we come into play is to help companies scale. So the things that we've been talking about so far today, uh, how you're splitting up equity among the team and getting your law firm involved, all of those things have been, um, you know, that's water under the bridge, that's how we come, come into play. So our focus is really on strategy, on go to market, on sales execution, on scaling the company operationally. There just become so many really, really important decisions that not to trivialize the things that we're talking about here, but the way we think about it is, hey, that those aren't even a consideration at this point. It's, um, what's the product market fit look like? What is the what are the unit economics, and how can we help your company grow faster uh, and be bigger? Because, like the other panels have been saying, it's really not about maximizing ownership; it's about maximizing economic value for yourselves and for your employees and your shareholders while delivering an incredible amount of value to your end customers. So there's just a lot of constituents that you have to manage, uh, including your board. And as soon as you raise institutional capital, um, as soon as the Series A comes in, certainly the Series B and the Series C and B where we typically get involved, um, the, the company is owned by syndicated professional institutional investors um, who have a lot of pattern recognition and they're really going to be driving the decisions. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it, it is the CEO who uh, sets the tone at the company and as long as that tone is resonating with the board, everything works well. Um, if it doesn't, um, then the CEO is often one of the first people to leave. Those are very tough decisions as an right. institutional investor. They come with an incredible amount of pain for um, obviously the CEO uh, personally who's being replaced, but for the investors and the company as well, there's an incredible amount of friction in that process because whoever comes in next uh, is going to have his own strategy. It's really hitting the reset button. You lose a lot of time. Um, and the way we think about markets is um, the markets that our companies are involved in, which is going to be enterprise software sales, are incredibly dynamic. And so um, they're, they're highly competitive. And for every decision that you're making from a strategic perspective, from a pricing perspective, Get a market perspective. Uh, your competitors are reacting to that, and then you're reacting to those reactions. So um, it is really, really dynamic. And when you have to hit the pause button, even if it's for three months or six months or a year, which is what I think the perfect it is when we change out a CEO, um, it does create a lot of pain for everyone for involved. Uh, absolutely. Now, what I put up here, and I'm going to come right back to you and Antoine, and then bring Sumner in here as well. Series A, usually, and this is, it varies a lot, three to 10 million, investors looking for 10X, you want that one home run to kind of pay for the fun, and, and that's what you're looking for there. Series B gets a little, in some of these names, and, and it's funny because my old boss said that, you know, series are kind of like A's, or grades, A, B, C, whatnot, but you're looking for like a five to 10X, that's your 15 to 30 million, that's when your bigger ventures, well, funds, the ones we've all heard about will probably step in, it sounds like you guys are playing kind of B to C. Yeah. And then C is going to be 
30 to 100 million, it, sometimes that's called a mezzanine round, it depends on if we're talking life sciences or maybe other, other rounds that come in. But tell me two things. What kind of returns are you guys looking for? And do you like to leave? Do you, in this area, and Steve can chime in again too, do you see VCs that want to leave and take the whole deal? Or is it a syndication play? How, how do people play around here? Yeah, so uh, I'll just comment on ourselves. Uh, whether we're leading or syndicating or financing, we're very flexible. We like to lead, um, but by no means need to lead. Uh, we like to lead because a lot of what we've been alluding to is, uh, I always like to say, hey, you can set the price if I can set the terms. Uh, <laughs> investing in, in the private markets is very, very different than buying stock on the NASDAQ or the S&P because you, know, you could say, hey, I want to be a unicorn and raise money at a billion dollar valuation. Um, we could sell the company for 500 million after raising at a billion and the investors could still make three times their money. A lot of financial engineering that happens, uh, but putting all that aside, the way we think about uh, returns, the stage that we're playing in, we really underwrite companies for two to five x returns in two to five years. We want to see optionality for something above that if everything goes right. If, uh, some of the new products that we're launching really get traction in the market. We can achieve greater than five x, uh, but it's unlikely that companies in our portfolio are going to be ten x and sorts of returns. We might get one out of 20 of those. That's how we really think about it. That being said, we should have um, many fewer losers. In fact, um, we should really have embedded downside protection in the securities that we're buying, and the enterprise value should support uh, a liquidation that would at least get us our money back. And so, go ahead. That, no, go ahead. That, that's important to, to highlight here. You know, these numbers can be misleading, right? But there's a certain amount of risk that's associated with each one, and the expected returns are different, right? Um, and you need to think about that as you're going through the various phases, like you're financing, right? And so you promise your LPs a certain return on your investment, and you're going to make sure that you get those returns with the prediction preferences, participation, the structure that you put into it, but also selecting companies that have less risk than the ones in Series A, right? So the, the rate of death is going to be higher over here than it is over there. So it's not that the earlier stage venture funds are getting 10x on every investment. No, most right? of them so are. That, that's, that's very important to kind of highlight. But, right, right. And, and, and generally, if you have 10 investments, hopefully one's a home run, two or three, or your two to three X, the rest are kind of in the middle, and then probably like three, four go BK or something like that, roughly. And it varies from year to year in, in section in different different industries and stuff like that. Um, Sumner and Bion and Steve, is there a difference between because biotech is so big here, obviously cyber too, what we see biotech in San Diego, what we see biotech here, Boston, do you guys play together? How does that work? Sure. Uh, so on the West Coast of San Diego specifically, we're looking far more at genetics right now. Uh, genetics is interesting. It is um, Illumina is kind of carrying that area in San Diego. Um, a lot of the companies that we funded, for example, we just funded one for Alzheimer's research. Uh, that's a genetics play. Ultimately, they are starting to look east, but right now they're playing only west coast and kind of working up that coast. Um, from our experience so far, the traditional biotech guys are starting to look into it and starting to move over to that space, um, but it's primarily staying on the west coast right now. Uh, it's just a, a, a and, and if you're doing a biotech deal, Brian, are you looking to partner up? It's hard for me to comment. We don't do any biotech investments. No, but okay. So, uh, uh, what is your primary focus again? We're really focused on enterprise software. So, uh, companies that are building software for other businesses to buy. We look at growth generally, so we'll dabble in some consumer things, but not really much. Um, we'll look at business services, but our focus is on B2B enterprise for this company. So, let me ask you, since you, the, you, know, you and Sumner are Definitely with your growth stuff. What do you think about the venture environment here? What's the problem? What's what's holding it up? So uh, it's a good question. It's a tough one to answer. We are based in the area very proudly, um, and we have invested in a number of companies in the area and have had great success with that. Um, one of the things that we see happening a lot with companies that are founded in this particular region is. Um, you know, this, the center of gravity in the venture capital universe is Silicon Valley. And those investors used to be 
hey, I don't want to invest outside the range yep. of my Tesla. Yep. Um, and I'd say that's largely true, but it's just also become so hyper competitive in that market that um, I'd say it's changing pretty rapidly. So we do see a lot of capital from outside the region being imported into the greater DC metro area. And a byproduct of that is a lot of the companies that are founded here and that are truly breakout companies will often then get pulled back to Silicon Valley. So maybe they're using Series A here, but um, pretty soon the majority of the team is on a plane to San Francisco and set up shop there in order to access the, the resources of, of that environment and frankly be closer to their core customers. And that's a problem, right? I mean, that's good and bad, I guess, but it... it but For us, we're totally geographic agnostic. I mean, of course, we also love investing in our backyard. We love supporting the ecosystem, but um, we want to invest in the absolute best companies or none and are happy to go wherever they are. So let's flip it. Uh, well, so, okay, so two things. I want to bring Antoine in here. One is, do you think this area can become like a Silicon Valley? And if so, what does that take? And the second thing is, when we talk about these unicorns and the soft bank and this thesis of investing in number ones and just deploying crazy amounts of money, do you think that's still operative or do you feel like that's broken having seen what happened to Lyft and Uber and et cetera? I'll just give quickly, this is my opinion, probably not the opinion of the firm. Um, there, there is a very distinct cultural difference between um, being in this region and being in Silicon Valley. About half our portfolio is in Northern California, so we spend a lot of time out there. And um, to a certain extent, I feel like I need to detox every time I'm coming back from being in the Valley, just <laughs> given how aggressive the culture is. But it's incredibly aggressive there. Yep. And people, people are absolutely willing, and it's almost an assumption of building a business, that you're going for broke. You're willing to run the company into a wall, even if you've created um, what is a, an incredible amount of enterprise value. Even if your business is worth 30 or 50 or 80 million dollars, um, people in the Valley um, are more than willing to push the throttle score forward and risk 100% of that in order to 10x that value. Totally. I think here that's probably less the case. I mean, look, if you build a company and it's worth 80 or 100 million dollars and you own 20 or 25% of that business and you're going to pull, you know, 15 to 30 million dollars out of that company, like that's pretty life changing wealth for the vast majority of people. Yeah. Um, almost generational wealth to a certain extent. So it's hard to say, hey, I'm going to risk my kids' college education and my mortgage and everything else. But that's a culture. That's exactly what you just asked one. Yeah, so I mean, I think you have to look at why, right? So why individuals in Silicon Valley are willing to kind of take that risk. Of course, there's reference points. Um, the other thing is like we always talk about IPO as being like the end all be all, 1% or less of companies that actually make it to institutional funding rounds actually get to IPO. So what is more likely is that there's going to be a strategic exit, right, an acquisition. Um, and so where are those acquirers? Um, there's a lot of aqua hires that actually happen in Silicon Valley. Um, there are a lot of large tech companies that actually buy other medium-sized tech companies. Uh, so if you think about managing risk, right, it's actually less risky in Silicon Valley to push forward than it is in other regions. Yeah, um, and that, that's not just in the U.S., but that, that's broad as well. Super, super quick point. I'm coming right back to you. It's funny because um, Sequoia Capital, one of the most well-known, successful uh, venture capital firms in the world, famously found, uh, funded Cisco Systems. And for a while, there was kind of a joke there that like a, a big portion of their portfolio were companies that they funded and sold right to Cisco. So it was like that was they already had the exit. You know, uh, I don't know if they planned out, but they had a lot of exits to Cisco. So that was very interesting. So tell me this, where does fuel play in this? We hear McKinsey, it's a huge name, big three. Now you guys are in this venture game. Why, what are you doing? How do you get involved in this? Um, so typically we're helping accelerate the growth as I was saying before. Um, so that's the professionalization of companies. Typically, you know, Steve was talking about before, earlier stage companies have one or two products. They thought about it for a while, they built the right team, they had traction. Once you start to raise Series B, Series uh, C, Series D funding, you need to expand that product portfolio, right? You need to extend into other customer segments and verticals. Um, there's a lot of decisions that you actually need to make from, you know, how do I create springboard roles within my organization to which are the most ideal customer profiles to go after. So I'm a company, I've got a Series B, I've got some money, we're rolling. 
how do I get you involved? How much does it roughly cost? What are you going to do for me? Yeah, so I'm not, not going to address the cost issue. Okay, fine. Um, uh, so we, we typically don't get involved uh, unless we believe that we can have outsized impact. So I will say that. Um, how do you get us involved? It starts with any other conversation, right? So we're getting to know the management team. Typically, we're speaking to board members as well. We might run light diagnostics, right, on pricing, go-to-market strategy, sales, a lot of the things you heard here today. Um, and then it's getting into the mindset of the leaders of the company and figuring out where they want to go and what they're wrestling with. So, for instance, uh, um, an example might be a company that has, has grown very quickly in managed services and they're thinking about marketplace. Or a company that is in the SMB B2B SaaS space that is serving white collar, northeastern uh, professional services companies. And they're thinking about moving across the company or across the country or into blue collar services, we'll help them kind of think through how they can do it. And it's not about whether you whether they won't be able to get to the answer themselves. Um, but because we have 30,000 consultants, we've been around for 100 years, um, I can pull the best team together in order to help create shortcuts to success, I should say. Let me ask you real quick, and I want to get into exits here as we're winding down. How do you think about it? Like, why did McKinsey want to get in this? Do you guys, like, have your, an internal sort of ROI or success things? Are you looking at it as a portfolio, or are you looking at it as a traditional consulting client? Like, how do you think yeah, about that? Way. That's a good question. So if you actually look at the S&P 500, um, even 10, 15 years ago, the typical lifespan of those companies was around 60 or 70 years. Um, we're talking about a rolling average of the last five to seven years. Now that lifespan is about 15, right? So um, new companies are becoming the big companies. Those big companies are tech companies. And so part of the strategy is we want to get there early. We need to understand what's going on. Um, also, a lot of our incumbent companies are defining or redefining themselves as tech companies. Right, so a large bank might say we're a tech company that happens to provide financial services. The third reason is that our competition is no longer investment banks and, and law firms. Yes, of course, um, the smartest individuals want to go there, but most of the people in this room are looking at tech, technology companies as well, too. So it's kind of those three reasons, right? Our talent wants to work on this. Uh, we believe that we can actually create outsized impact for the next generation of Fortune 500 companies. And the leading incumbents are now redefining themselves and having to um, uh, reinvent themselves as technology companies. Quick question, and we'll flip right into the next thing. I mean, and I'm not trying, I'm, I'm just asking. Do you feel that at this point, McKinsey's leading or following that change? Leading or following You said the tech, you know, the, a lot of companies yeah. do define themselves yeah. as tech companies, so you're kind of like, that's where the market's going. Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah, yeah, you? I think it's a little bit of both, right? Um, and that, that's the beauty of McKinsey, right? So we work with, you know, a lot of the, the top companies. So we bring, that perspective, um, but yeah, we're working with some, some of the new leaders as well. Too. So now let me open it up. We talked about exits real quick, winding this down, the zero to IPO, and, and absolutely right, IPO is not likely for most companies, and it's not necessarily after Sarbanes-Oxley and other things, and in my personal opinion, and I'm not giving any commentary on that. Um, you know, you may not want to be a public company. You saw a lot of public companies go private again. Um, what are the normal exits? How do I think about an exit? Do I even start thinking about an exit when I start? When, how do I figure all that out? Anyone can jump in. Yeah, I'll say, um, so we uh, do take a number of companies public every year. Um, but three companies in the portfolio public in the past year. That being said, uh, it oftentimes is not the most attractive exit for um, investors or shareholders or uh, the team for long list of reasons. So uh, exits are really um, to other financial sponsors, um, larger private equity funds coming down into the space, strategic acquirers, and going public is not a liquidity event, it's a financing event, but it does get you liquidity on, on your shares. So I think um, the high level comment that I would say is the best in class companies are bought, not sold. So when we think about operating our companies and the scale where we are, which is almost every one of them is exitable, is, hey, look, the focus is on building a, a really, really strong company, and don't worry about the exit. Um, if you have a premium asset on uh, oceanfront property, there's gonna be a buyer for that. Um, just, there always is, so don't worry about whether it's gonna be Cisco or HP or whatever. Just focus on executing every day, um, and the exit tends to take care of itself. I, I just wanna, reinforce that about as strong as I can. Um, the people who try to 
uh, make their companies look good for exits are usually people who have weaknesses on the horizon or they're already there. And you can't fool people. So uh, you can't time your exit. Now, when you're doing your financings, everybody's going to ask you, well, what's your exit strategy? Given your marketplace, who are the companies that are going to be willing to buy you? Because the odds are, as we said, that you're not going to go public. Only a small percentage of the companies do. So who's going to buy you? So you have to have thought about a class of buyers, strategic buyers who are other companies that really are going to need what you've got to complement what they're selling, or uh, financial buyers who, by the way, uh, oftentimes pay less than the strategic buyers. So you've got you to have thought about that. Having said that, you don't really want to think about it when you're building a company. You, you want to think about it in the sense of, you, are you going astray? Are you going in a direction where nobody cares? If you're doing that, you've got bigger problems. But if you've got a big customer base and you're growing your sales and you've got great margins, there are going to be people who are going to want to buy your company. And, and, but, but you can't time it. You, you'll get inbound offers. Usually the first inbound offers are not the ones you want. And uh, if, if you build the best company you can build, that's how you sell for a, a handsome price. So I will piggyback on it. There are things you can do to, to be ready for an exit deal, right? And typically that takes about 12 to 24 months of prep work um, beforehand. You shouldn't focus on it, but having the right CEO, structures, auditing, all that stuff is very, very important. Um, right. you, you have to build your infrastructure along the way. You can't clean up your act just before an acquisition. <laughs> We're, we're going to wrap here in, once, in, in about 30 seconds, but just super quick, anyone comment? How do we feel about the whole um, trend about staying private much longer? Do we think that's good, bad, or do you think it's going to stay this way? Yeah, I, okay. I didn't jump in on that. Um, so off, based off of all this talk about exits, I think what we are going to see, I'll take a little bit more of an unconventional approach here. Um, you know, what we're seeing at Carter, just across you know, the 12,000 companies that we're working with, a lot of late stage. You're seeing direct listings with Spotify and uh, Slack, who is, a, who is a customer of ours. Um, what we believe is that the, the, the core kind of prohibitive variable in this equation is, is access to liquidity. And that if you're able to solve that, we think that it changes the way that companies think about long-term vision. And so um, one of the things we're really excited about is, is helping to provide, uh, provide liquidity uh, channels to these privately held companies to give them much more runway, you know, potentially indefinitely, just because there is so much access to capital in, in the private market. Tremendous. Thank you guys. For Antoine, Bayon, Cody, Steve, Rose, and Sumner, we're going to thank this panel for their excellent work.